Who you want to be. We want to see your best Korean impression. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get random names assigned yesterday. They also gave me like a very different name tag. I just, nobody registered me, including myself. So, <laughs> so the session is not being recorded or live streamed, is that right? Uh, it is being, it is being live streamed. Oh, is it? Okay. It's recorded. Sorry, it's being recorded for being... So we do have to make sure that we're, like, talking into these. Uh, yeah, the, it's not, the sound will be amplified in the room, so if you don't share it, it's not a big deal. The rooms have, um, sound capture separate from the mics, so Everyone's just talk into them, yeah. But you want to hear it, that's not a problem. Alright, cool. <clears throat> um... Well, first I should apologize that despite what it says in your schedule, I'm not Corinne McSherry. Um, but when you really think about it, very, very few people are. <laughs> My name is Elliot Harmon, and I am the director of activism at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and I'm really excited about this discussion, and, and this combination of people I, I, I think is going to make for a really great discussion, as well as everyone in the audience, too. Um, we have here uh, Paul Keller, who is the chair of Kennisland, uh, Emma Alonzo, who is the director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology, uh, Ryan Clough, who is the general counsel at Public Knowledge, and Kylie Papalardo, who is the lecturer, who is a lecturer at the Intellectual Property and Innovation Law Research Group at Queensland University of Technology. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about sort of the idea behind this this panel, and then I'm I'm really gonna gonna step back and just kind of let the conversation go where it may. I think it's safe to say that. 2018 is the year that platform moderation became a mainstream topic um, to the point that there are you know, major politicians, including the President of the United States, talking about it a lot. Um, and there are lots of discussions about what platforms should or should not do about all kinds of things that might take place on their websites. Uh, misinformation and human trafficking um, and terrorism. Um, and then there's this kind of constant specter of bias and, 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 and people accusing platforms of being biased. Um, and all of this is, of course, uh, bubbling up not just in the form of pressure on platforms to moderate or not moderate certain types of, of activity, uh, but it's also bubbling up in the in the form of public policy proposals, both in the U.S. and in Europe and in other places. What's funny is that so much of this discussion seems to lack some kind of historical context. That the the people in this room and indeed in this this whole conference know that these debates about what platforms should or shouldn't do to remove certain kinds of content are not new debates at all. They've been taking place for over 20 years, um, mostly under the header of, of enforcing copyright. Um, so as we look back, as it were, on the copyright wars, and we look at lots of the things that have been tried, both uh, in, in, in platform moderation practices and in public policy, things that have tried and failed a lot of them, what lessons can we take uh, for talking about content moderation more generally? Um, it, it seems to me like I'm, I'm going to ask the panelists just a couple of questions to get things started here. Um, and then my hope is to then open this up to the whole group and have people uh, chime in with, with questions as you like. Um, it, it seems to me that one of the important topics to kind of start this discussion with uh, is, is the question of automated filtering. Um, certainly, automated filtering has been uh, 
a thing, a thing that's developed largely in the form of copyright enforcement for, for quite some time now. Um, and now suddenly there are proposals both in the US and, and most recently the, in Europe uh, for mandatory filtering. Emma, I know that you like are, are somebody who's thought a lot about automated filtering and kind of what it works or doesn't work for. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems like this is a moment when it's becoming more and more a, a, a lever that, uh, that policymakers want to pull. What's going on here? And is there something about the technology itself that's being like misrepresented by lawmakers? <laughs> Yeah, it, misrepresented or misunderstood. Um, oh, if we don't need to use these, I guess I'll just shout. Um, yeah, so the, the kind of the whole question of using filters, um, especially in the, the copyright debate, right, that, that's a question that's been around for, you know, 20, 25 years. This idea that if, um, you know, a rights holder identifies an infringing file, uh, a lot of times what they would really like to see as a remedy is not just notice and takedown of that particular file at that particular URL, but notice and stay down. Notice and like keep once the platform is on notice about a particular file existing somewhere on its service, um, really wanting the platform to make sure it doesn't reappear in other places. Uh, and that's been a, a concept that's been fought back and forth, um, both in the law about whether laws actually require that kind of remedy. And for example, the, the DMCA does not. Um, you need to identify the specific URL where infringing content is hosted, um, and there's not a kind of proactive, keep it down legal obligation on content hosts. Um, but it's also been kind of fought out in just the, the practice and the policies um, that different content hosts uh, provide. So a lot of platforms have developed, you know, deduplication technology. Um, on the one hand, that can be useful in uh, minimizing kind of your overall storage and server costs, right? You don't need 19 people to upload a copy of the same video, you can realize that someone's uploaded a duplicate copy and say, oh, that's fine. We'll just, we'll point the people you want to link to this file to this one copy that we're hosting. Um, but it's also obviously a kind of a matching technology that is very appealing to, um, to rights holders as well who want to say, you know, look, you can actually identify when somebody's trying to upload the same or a substantially similar file. So the kind of the discussion about what is technically possible for um, for a content host, for a platform to do has obviously, you know, grown and changed a lot um, over the past 25 years as different technologies for identifying what's in a file um, and matching it to what other files you host have grown. Uh, but there's, so one thing that we see as kind of the talk about automated filtering is shifting from really a, a big copyright issue into kind of looking at more different types of problematic content um, that someone, whether a policymaker or a user or a platform, might want to keep off their platform. Um, we're starting to see a lot of that kind of thinking around copyright shift into things like hate speech or terrorist propaganda. Um, for example, uh, a number of the, the major um, social media platforms and content hosts, um, including Facebook, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Microsoft is kind of the, the inaugural platforms, um, created a few years ago what a, a hash database for terrorist content. So this is material that they identify on their platforms as somehow violating one of the platform's terms and conditions against um, terrorist propaganda or content that advocates terrorism. Um, you know, each platform has kind of their own definition of what counts as terrorist content. Um, they kind of decided that it would be useful amongst themselves to be able to share information about, for example, a new beheading video that has been uploaded or a new piece of kind of ISIS propaganda that um, probably most of the platforms ultimately don't want to host. Um, so they created this mechanism that formalized a little bit of sharing that I think was kind of already <clears throat> informally happening across different platforms um, to essentially create hashes or, or digital fingerprints of particular files, share that with other content hosts and say, you know, you can add this to your scanning that you may do of files that are uploaded to make sure that you can easily kind of identify and keep off of your site, for example, a new beheading video. So there, again, it's this in this complex kind of area of there's some like 
technical and practical utility of these sorts of technologies, um, but there are also things that policymakers um, really, really want to see kind of used much more broadly. So as kind of new technical innovations are developed, um, that really, we see that start bleeding into the, the legal and policy debates as well. Um, but I think one kind of overarching point that has, you know, existed through all of the copyright fights, and certainly when we're talking about content like terrorist propaganda or hate speech or even you know defamation or harassment, context matters. And if you have a technical tool that is identifying like matching content or matching file hashes, you are not that tool is not doing an assessment of context. It's not doing an assessment of, you know, who is the person posting this? Does that change the legal status of this content? What is the context they're posting it in? Is it in an academic paper? Is it in a news article? Is it, you know, in some historical documentation? That may very well change both the kind of legal and kind of policy status of that file or of that piece of content um, in a way that technical tools still don't and likely won't be able to take into account. You you hit on such an important point there that to me feels like it gets lost in these discussions a lot of the time that being able to identify a copy of a specific file is is a very different thing than being able to make a judgment about whether something is fits in w w whatever problematic category we're talking about. Um, I've been, over the past year, uh, working a lot on, on the fight over SESTA-FOSTA, a, a bill having to do with human trafficking that passed in the U.S. And you kept hearing these arguments about uh, how easy it should be for computers to identify that context when there's a, a, a really big leap that people are just kind of ignoring. Um, Paul, it seems like, like in a lot of ways what happened in Europe last week is kind of the elephant in the room in, in, in this discussion. Um, and it also like, it's not new. These kinds of mandatory filtering proposals have been around for a long time, both in the US and in Europe. Maybe you could talk a little bit about <coughs> what happened this time. So what happened, um, the people, people will maybe have seen me looking this way, <laughs> for that, which is because of an idiotic uh, formulated or formatted document of the, the, the European Union published, <laughs> which is the so-called four column document, which puts the three positions next to each other, and for some reason they put it like this, so, um, but I, I, did a, I did a quick check again, and so the, the thing is, the, the entire proposal, this entire 250-page document, the word filter doesn't appear in it once. This is like, like officially this isn't about filtering, um, what we had, like, so to some degree um, that the, we made it about filtering, so we, we, we took the proposal, the commission came out and, and, and basically said, if, if you want to achieve the things, if the requirements that the commission lays down there, which are indeed in the, mainly in, in, in the sphere of notice and stay down, are impossible to realize without mandatory filtering technology. It is something that we have relatively successfully spun into a narrative of um, uh, upload filters, censorship filters, etc. Um, that worked for a while until it didn't work for us anymore. When it didn't work for us anymore was maybe the 12th of September, um, the date you're referring to. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's also important to, to realize that this was probably never about filters. Like, this is not like the, the, the principal <coughs> ask and the principal uh, a, a position that the, uh, the, the, the rights holders who are behind the the proposals in, in the European Union have is not so much that they necessarily want the platforms to filter stuff. Um, they want to undermine the liability regime for platforms. That's been like there for the last 20, 25 years, um, probably more 20 than 25 because it's not that old. So for the last 20 years, that has been their sore point. To the extent um, when, when the commission started talking about we need to review the Copyright Act, 
like all of us here in this room or the people here in the room who've been involved in that were thinking, oh, copyright reform. And we were thinking about <laughs> user rights, harmonization, etc. <laughs> um, the, the other side can use the term copyright reform and pretty much the same thing. And the number one thing they want to reform in copyright is the intermediary liability provisions. That's the thing that's been, been, been like the, the, the most problematic aspect of copyright from the perspective of large rights holder organizations. They really think um, the system is broken for them. And for them, it's more or less, in I mean, this is, you need to understand how, how, how your opponents operate. But for them, this is really a, a flaw in the system that there is large commercial entities who can, can earn money by using, and they're like, um, don't want to get, get into legal details, but by developing services that somehow deal with content without being required to ask for their permission first. That's broken for them from their perspective. The system is broken, and that's what they're trying to fix. And that is what they made a big step towards um, over the summer, summer in Europe. Because in that four-column document <laughs> here, um, there is um, the, the commission, actually, the original proposal was relatively... Um, was relatively careful there. The commission did not, in its original impact assessment, assess, like, they didn't touch on changing the liability regime. They had in some of the recitals of the proposal, they said this shouldn't be read as touching the liability system. But, uh, and, and I mean, this is speculation on my part, but it, I, I, I'm pretty certain they put this in because they knew it didn't take a lot in order to take the Commission's text in the Parliament, in the Council, in order to turn that into something which fundamentally changes the liability regime. And we are now with uh, uh, going into negotiations between the Commission, the Parliament and the Council um, in a situation where two of these texts fundamentally basically include a rewrite of the, uh, uh, of, of the intermediary liability provisions for what they call online content service sharing providers, um, which reminds me always of the, 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 the acronyms in use in the Soviet Union at some point. But, um, and it is relatively likely if three parties go into a, um, into a negotiation and two have this within the negotiation mandate, that in the end result, we will come out with a legal text that will change the uh, intermediary liability provisions. So, and that will, there will be filtering, will then be probably a consequence that, that platforms will need to implement in order to be able to offer services as we know them in compliance with the new legal regime. But I don't think filtering was the, the main ask from the beginning. We could, it was easier for us, for our side, to say, like, we're against filtering. People are trying to filter the Internet. That is something that sounds relatively concrete and, 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 and understandable to, to larger parts of the general public than if you go into and start talking about liability uh, limitations, which is something, like, nobody outside of this room or, uh, <laughs> like, very few people outside of this room actually understand what that means and how that relates to them, their daily use of the Internet. Um, so, so yeah, I think we've got ourselves a bigger problem than filtering here at this point. I feel like, like, I to press. <laughs> Sorry. one of the like inherent problems when you move from a, a voluntary takedown regime to, uh, you know, a, a legal mandate is accounting for the fact that in that takedown regime a bunch of mistakes are going mm -hmm. to happen and there's a bunch <laughs> of opportunities for abuse um, and that you need, and I think it varies from platform to platform in a way that's really hard to codify, uh, safeguards for, uh, for protecting users' rights, which of course was a, a big part of the intention behind the Santa Clara principles. Kylie, I know that this is an issue that you've done a lot of thinking about of mm -hmm. how you can take these kind of common sense due process things and scale them, or indeed whether you can when you're talking about millions of pieces of content. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Is due process <laughs> yeah. scalable? Yeah, so scale I think is the big issue here, right? This is, this is why we even start to talk about things like filtering because if, if we're looking at content on platforms, um, and what platforms we're increasingly expect, 
expecting platforms to deal with. It's hate speech, it's copyright infringement, it's defamation, it's revenge porn. Um, all of these areas of law have very different rules for when we would expect somebody to act upon them. And they have very different rules even within a country. So even within my country of Australia, the rules are very different, let alone across many different countries and millions of pieces of content. Um, and as Emma was saying, a lot of this is about context. So um, to have people trying to make decisions about when to take content down or when to filter, what we end up with are these sort of really messy rule documents that we only ever see when there's a leak. <laughs> um, we have, there's a lot of low level, um, like low salary employees in developing countries having to look at this content hours and hours on end, make decisions in very short time frames about whether to pull them down or not. It, it just gets really messy, this issue of scale. So um, I think the big question is really about um, what can we do to try to manage this? Um, and this is where due process comes in, I think. And by due process, what we're talking about is um, can we increase the transparency? Can we increase the reliability? Um, can we provide some sort of uh, more robust appeals process when mistakes happen, as they inevitably will? Um, so I guess my thinking around it has been, well, in thinking about it before this panel, which um, is about the lessons we can learn from copyright, was thinking about it in the context of the DMCA, which we all know is not perfect. But um, one of the advantages of the DMCA, I think, is that it at least tries to set out some procedures for intermediaries to act at scale without having to be a sort of quasi-judicial body. Right, to sort of to be making these context judgments. But there's a lot that can be improved on those processes. Um, we know from the work of EFA and other EFF, sorry, and other organizations that there's a lot of issues around accuracy of <coughs> some of these takedowns, a lot of mistakes happen, there are problems. Um, so how can we deal with those? Increased transparency, I think, is a big one. Um, but I also think the biggest challenge will be the sort of post hoc systems we can set in place. So what is increasingly happening at a platform level is that they're focusing on accuracy of notices and accuracy of takedowns, which is great, right? But in, in seeking to optim optimize accuracy and sometimes in, in turning to sort of the technologies that Emma was talking about, um, they're talking about trying to get to 98% accuracy or 99% accuracy, which is great on any sort of normal metric, but when you're talking about huge platforms, even a 2% mistake rate is still millions of pieces of content, potentially. So what can we do about that? And that is where the systems come in about appeals processes, I think. Um, Again, with the DMCA, there's the counter notification system. Everybody on both sides hates that system. The rights holders think that it's too easy for a user just to counter notify, um, but studies show that it's notoriously underused actually by users. Um, my own empirical work with um, like YouTube artists and other creators, um, I saw that they're, they're really scared of it. They don't understand the ramifications of lodging a counter notice, um, whether that will mean that they end up in court. They're really worried about doing it, so they just don't. Um, so we do need, I think, a system that's more accessible, that doesn't have the access barriers of a court system, but is ideally more independent than the platforms. We are still at very early stages of thinking about this. I think there hasn't been enough thought about this. Um, early days of what to do about it. Uh, the UN's Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression has sort of put forward an idea about a sort of social media council that would sit outside of the platforms and have a kind of first run go at trying to decide some of the more complex issues around takedowns of hate speech and stuff. Again, not perfect, but um, I think what we need to, to remember when we're thinking about it is 
is that moderation is hard. It's inevitably political. Um, and and to develop a system that will that will be reliable, that will be consistent, is really hard. We need to pay attention, careful attention to the costs, incentives, and risks involved, and probably take guidance from the work that started to happen at the international level. So the UN guiding principles are for businesses and human rights, stuff like the Santa Clara principles or the Manila principles. These are at least documents we can start from in, in starting to think about how we can scale due process. It just occurred to me, and I've, I've kind of been laughing to myself about this, that we all keep using the word mistakes to describe problems with, with these systems. Um, when, in fact, it's not only mistakes, it's often also bad actors yes. uh, and, and intentionally trying to abuse these takedown regimes. Um, and of course, we have protections intended to use to fight those bad actors in, in the DMCA. Um, but there are problems with them. Anyway, Ryan, I know that you you <laughs> have thought a lot about these problems. And I guess, like, to me, the big question is, given those issues, just when we're talking about copyright, uh, how do we prevent from trolling when we're talking about potentially much more dangerous scenarios. Sure. So in terms of, I think, generalized lessons that you can take about abuse from the copyright context and that are, I think are useful in this larger discussion and this brave new world of moderating a thousand other things, uh, I'd start with saying that I think there are two general categories of abuse. They're somewhat distinct, but they're both relevant and to the broader content moderation debate. So one is just uh, people who file, t or entities who file takedown requests, who their intent is to get at the same intent and enforce the same principle behind the takedown regime, like they're trying to remove infringing content, but they're just reckless in how they do it. So they, they don't, uh, they're not nearly selective enough in how they, uh, they submit their takedown requests, the evidence behind them is shoddy at best, negligent, reckless, whatever you want to say. So that's one category of abuse. The other category of abuse is different, and it's where obviously you have people submitting takedown requests for motivations that are really not the motivation that the takedown request was designed for. So you've, there have been legions of examples of DMCA uh, takedown uh, requests being submitted to silence a competitor, for example, or to silence political speech that you don't like. And both of these types of abuse are, I think it's fair to say, rampant in the 20 year history of the DMCA. And as you create these regular processes for taking down massive amounts of content, as Kyler was saying, at scale, then of course all these actors are going to strategically use it for their own purposes. And so, I mean, the numbers here are quite staggering. I, I think a lot of folks are probably familiar with um, the, the, the study by Jennifer Urban and, her, and other colleagues in 2016. I mean, her, some of these numbers were like, there, in, in some contexts there were 30%, even 50% of the takedown uh, requests submitted were, were re seriously flawed or just like facially invalid in a lot of cases. I, I'll just echo what Kylie said, even if it's only 5%, um, which is like probably on the very low end, you're talking about millions of takedown requests. So the scale here is, is staggering and the evidence is overwhelming that both of those types of abuse exist. Just a couple other quick lessons. Um, one is that we obviously talk a lot about automated filtering on the platform side in terms of proactively dealing with or identifying um, infringing content. Well, there's also a tremendous use of automated technologies in on the requester side, on the takedown uh, submitter side, to even identify and submit automatically what they want to take down. And I think that's really been behind the avalanche of millions and millions of takedown requests to the big, uh, especially the big platforms. Um, going along with that, you also see um, a lot of third-party agents and sort of professionalized takedown submitters popping up. And um, you see a lot of content holders outsourcing their, their copyright enforcement efforts to them. And I think both of those trends, automated technologies on the requester, enforcer side, and the use of third-party agents, that's structurally driven, I think, what's behind a lot of the abusive situations. And so going into content moderation, I think we need to look at where that's going to be likely, where we're creating incentives for 
those kinds of like professionalized, massive, um, automated takedown requests, even if it's just a, a private regime that's not like required by law, you could see platforms design takedown or flagging requests that create major incentives for those kinds of actors to develop over time, whose cost incentives are frankly like heavily weighted towards abuse. Um, and then the last thing I'll just say quickly is that the DMCA, you know, the, there, there, there are many success stories in the DMCA, I think. The, the deterrence of abuse is clearly not one of them. And uh, I, I think just one lesson here is that when the law creates um, Incentive, creates a, a stick of intermediary liability in any way, even a limited one in the DMCA, um, then the platforms are going to be incre typically incredibly restrained in going after and punishing regular abusers because they, they'd rather not be sued uh, than sort of cut off someone for submitting multiple bad faith or baseless requests. And so I think that's another issue is there needs to be both more legal incentives to protect public interest and free expression um, by punishing abuse, there also needs to be really careful attention paid to making sure that platforms have sufficient latitude, legally and otherwise, to punish abusive submitters. EFF was just recently hit by one of these, these uh, third party copyright enforcement companies. And as far as we can tell, it was literally just that the page that they asked to have delisted from Google had the phrase MP3 tunes in it, talking, <laughs> talking about the MP3 tunes case. Um, you know, notwithstanding the fact that MP3 tunes is a defunct company that hasn't been in business for several years, like some musician was in theory paying this company to, you know, scour the internet for mentions of this service that didn't exist anymore. It's just, it's incentivizing such a crappy business model that isn't helping anybody, the users or the copyright holders or anybody. I'll just say my, there's so many examples that we could get into, but my favorite one, frankly, is uh, there was an agent for the English Premier League who submitted a takedown request on Google, not just for infringing face Facebook links, but for the entirety of Facebook. <laughs> Now, actually, that's we laugh about it, but that's actually what like copyright bills have tried to do in the past in the United States. So you know, like SOPA. But anyway, um, I'd love to open it to to people who have who have questions that they'd like to add to the mix here. Um, you're talking about uh, the abuse of people or organizations or whatever of um, the DMCA of the system, but how about the other side. How about really honest, legitimate people whose works have been exploited online who want to get their material taken down and can't because the DMCA doesn't really work for them? If that's not a secret, it's well known. Could you talk a little about abuse or, or, or just problems on the other side by honest people, not not terrible people who are who are developing all sorts of weird technology to you know to cause trouble. If a person really wants to get their stuff taken down and it has been put up for the wrong reason, what objections do you have about reforming the system for that? Or what do you have to say in general about it? Who would like to <laughs> take that first? Are you talking about copyright or just more or broad more broadly than just copyright? I'm just talking about takedown. You know, we're okay. talking about the DMCA, the, the possibility of takedown, the abuse of the takedown system. Yeah. And, you know, the other side of it, uh, how it works for people who really do have a need to have stuff taken down. Mm, I, I do think that it it's, can be very complex. I mean, I come, my country, we don't have the equivalent of um, 512, which would protect intermediaries from liability um, in areas outside of, of copyright law. So, um, and there is a lot of content that can be quite harmful that I think we do need to think very seriously about its role in various contexts online. Um, so we've had some quite robust discussions in Australia around content like um, racist content, um, content that is is very harmful to to people not just economically but can put them at risk um, and be, and again we don't have a first amendment so um, we have 
very different ways of looking at free speech in Australia. And I, I do think that these are questions that we need to, we do need to talk about because I, I don't, even, even though I think it's very important that the internet is um, free for innovation, etc., I don't think it ought to be a wild west of, of anything goes and we don't regulate anything. But these are very complex questions. Um, there's a lot of nuance from both sides. And unless we engage in these difficult discussions, which is not about automation, we cannot automate those discussions, then I, I don't think anybody on either side will ever really be happy with what we're doing. And uh, just to your question about kind of um, like individual creators and, you know, when, when copyright's working at its best, it incentivizes and enables individual creators to share what it is that, you know, that they're creating and, and make money off of it and be able to feed themselves. You know, it's, it's a good thing. Um, I think the, the, for me, the question is like, what are the pieces of the DMCA system that are failing these people? Mm. And, you know, is it about um, kind of volume of notices that platforms get and these notices aren't given proper consideration? Is it about like how to establish that the person issuing the notice really is the appropriate rights holder? Is it, you know, I could imagine that for some platforms they're so inundated with high volume automated notices from big name rights holders that a lot of the individual claims get lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. um, if that's one of the problems, then that, that points to a certain set of solutions of like trying to, as Ryan was saying, like, restrict the kind of the incredible high volumes of really low quality notices um, that kind of gum up the system and and tailor it more to be responsive to these kinds of legitimate claims um, but if there's a, if it's a different sort of problem then I think it, it points to different solutions so I, I agree with you that <coughs> that sort of thing is a problem that's deeply frustrating for mm. individual creators and can really be the difference between them being able to make a living as a as a creator of some sort um, and not but I think it, it points to how I think as all of us have recognized the DMCA system is is far from perfect, um, and it's it is actually kind of the voices of these individual creators who have I think different problems from you know a, mm. a big name you know kind of yeah. rights holder organization trying to enforce copyright, um, you know, and I, I agree I don't think the current system is really oriented primarily to those kinds of concerns. And and it does actually go to that first lot of. Um, wrong kind of notices you were talking about that are incorrect out of genuine mistake or out of genuine um, people not quite understanding the way the notices need to be formatted or what they need to say and, and a lot of that is about transparency and education and helping people to use the system in, in productive ways um, rather than the ways that, that will end up that their notices get lost or ignored. Yeah, if I could just quickly add, I mean I'm certainly not, and I don't think anybody on this panel is saying don't use any reporting tools at all, don't have takedown mm -hmm. mechanisms at all. I think I, I would struggle to come up with a broad framework that's more appropriate to the problem. Um, and mm -hmm. as I think Kelly was saying, like establishing some rules that sort of provide clear guidelines and, and sort of barriers for how to deal with this problem. But the, the reality is this has to be a balance. And, and so all of this is just figuring out what the right balance is. And I do think that in a lot of these debates, there's a lot of polarization about like the, a lot of the creators say like, it's not working for us, but they're unwilling to acknowledge any of the downsides to DMCA. And, and frankly, the critics should absolutely acknowledge the, the legitimate challenges that the creators face online. So I think all sides would be served by like, recognizing that it's, it's more about the balance being struck and then figuring out what the problems are in reality. Mm -hmm. We've all been using the word transparency a lot. Um, and I, I like, yeah, we have the transparency section of the, of the Santa Clara principles up here, which is good. Um, I keep thinking when it comes to things like automated filtering, like on a kind of gut level, I'm like, yes, there should be more transparency. They should be sharing the algorithms with us. They should be showing us that human review process and what that looks like and what the things they're looking for is. But then I wonder if there's this tension of more transparency perversely leading to uh, takedown systems that are easier to game. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Like, <laughs> just that I, I think it, 
maybe it was Brian who said, you know, kind of any takedown system or tool that's put in place, whether it's policies, whether it's like, here's the notice, or here's the form you use to file your notice, any of those systems that are designed for one kind of legitimate content removal will also be used by everybody else who wants to see content taken down for whatever reasons they are. And so that's absolutely mm -hmm. so like anytime you think about crafting any policy or tool or mm -hmm. transparency, you have to be kind of red teaming it. You have to be thinking, how are people going to abuse this? What are the unintended uses of this that are going to lead to really, um, you know, really bad consequences that are not what the, the goal of it is. Um, as far as kind of transparency, I, you know, in a, a certain sense, transparency about what policies are. Mm -hmm. I think if you have people gaming that system, sometimes the way people game the system about, for example, hate speech is by not saying hate speech. And that's good. That's exactly what you want them to do. It's like, oh, this is what you consider hate speech? Then I won't say that. And then they have not said hate speech, which is great. It's, ha it's harder with some... So that leads to kind of in two directions. One, if the goal of your hate speech policy is to try to get people from expressing hateful opinions, you know, that may not be satisfying, right? You may still, you ha may have somebody who's figured out how to kind of comply with the letter of the law, and they're still saying something that's like, a really pretty horrible opinion about a different group or um, you know or, or class of people, uh, and and so that may not be fully satisfying. That kind of gaming is a problem, or you know something like harassment. People who want to figure out how to harass someone will again try to figure out how to stay in the within the letter of the law and can kind of build on that. So it's I think it's it, there is a kind of a fundamental tension of if you have a really dedicated adversary who wants to figure out how to do what they want to do on your platform, um, you know, from the platform perspective, it can be difficult to figure out the, the right balance. Um, but things like publish it, so I, I switched us to the, the numbers section of the Santa Clara Principles, which is asking even just for more kind of raw data type information about the scope and scale of content moderation. Um, one of the sort of the gaming concerns that we've heard a lot as we've kind of promoted this idea that platforms should report on their content moderation in general um, <laughs> was also just the the concern from a lot of folks, platforms and, and advocates alike, that you know, putting these numbers out there may draw even more attention from policymakers, from lawmakers, who may either say, on the one hand, your numbers are too low, you're not doing enough, we need to compel you by law to do more. Um, or, on the other hand, you put out numbers that are really big, and then all the headlines are, you know, hate speech rampant on Platform X, which is not what anybody ever wants to see um, for their shareholders. So, you know, I, I think... For me, I feel like the past six months of, you know, every issue is now a content moderation issue no, has no. sort of obviated some of those concerns. Like, uh, there's no keeping discussion about this out of the public eye. It's very much mm. in the public eye. So now we're all just having conversations in kind of a vacuum of actual fact. Mm. Um, so I still, uh, at the end of the day, I still think getting numbers and other kinds of transparency are essential because we're having really active public policy discussions about this. And we, a lot in a lot of ways, don't even know what we're talking about. Mm. So I just want to come maybe maybe also a little bit back to your question. So in, in the copyright space, right, like not with hate speech or anything else, this is essentially like this is the, the notice and takedown, the filtering is not about having wanting to have that material appear or not appear. In the end, it's, it, it's part of a kind of like dance in order to negotiate remuneration, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, mm. And so, so in that space, like we need to be very careful. And this, this, like we, we, we should not try to, to cure the symptom, which is like the 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 filters, and 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 find ways. How can we make filters less harmful by applying transparency, etc. Like all the things that we talked about. But we need to look at the root cause, and that is like like how can we come to a system where where like we have these open platforms? They enable a a a a, a wonderful. Um, new way of exchanging, of communicating by all kinds of actors with all kinds of other actors and how can we adopt the renumeration systems that we have in place for other things in order for that notice and takedown stuff really to be like the cure to excesses that happen on the platform but not like the, the mechanism to, to police like the everyday business on that thing. And uh, uh, so, so I think like yeah, we need to go back and understand also what are the instruments, and you look, at least in the European context, you look, of course, at instruments related to collective management of rights, etc., 
what are the instruments that we can bring into the game that 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 allow us to 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 rebalance this space in a way that doesn't have all these negative connotations about freedom of expression, individual users rights because like whatever systems we build like they will get like if they need to to cover the entire breadth of that they will get more complex and that will always favor like the big actors who can deal with these and who can have automation in place and they will kind of run over like 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 the smaller actors who may ha have legitimate interests in that but they also may only want to have like a a fair share of uh, uh, of what's going around there, and that probably does is isn't something that you go via notice and take down and then negotiations mm -hmm. based on that. Mm -hmm. I think a lot, we have a lot of questions now. Right? Just about five more minutes, so let's let's see how many people we can get to. Okay, I, I'll be quick. So, um, Paul, I'm really interested in your comments because I think they're it's, it's dead right. It's, it's very interesting about how much the discussion uh, around Article 13 in yeah. Europe was this issue of the value gap and. It, it was about an issue of, 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 of fair pay to artists. Um, but I was also interested in your point about how the goal was to undermine the liability regime. regime. And I was thinking about the, it, it was like recital 38 of, I think, the yeah. text, which basically said, it had no force of law, but basically saying that if you do anything more than sort of passive hosting, if you're, if you're engaged in either the, the promotion or the optimization of content, mm -hmm. you're sort of engaged in active hosting that takes you out of the, the safe harbor. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in the other types of, of content, of terrorist content, everything else, it seems they're really pushing platforms to take on exactly that role of being an acting, active host. And so I wonder, do you think there's a point at which the, 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 the obligations to moderate on one side pushes, pushes on the other side the platforms right out of the safe harbor if, if Recital 38 is the guidance of law? So I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure if I'm the right person to answer a question. So I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not following like the the things that are not copyright direct related as closely as I follow the copyright stuff. Um, to to some degree, uh, like I think a thought that occurred to a lot of us in the um, on our side of the, the the discussion around Article 13 and the copyright directive, like the the only sensible position I still believe from the beginning was delete article 13 because it's ill thought of and it is not not necessarily because like we want to preserve the status quo as it is but like like the way it is like it touches on much more fundamental questions around like the role of platforms in the digital environment which go way beyond copyright as you say and so, so, so I think our like Comunia's and many others position has from from the get go, and like I mean, it's useless now to say that because it's not going to happen. Like, delete Article 13 from this copyright directive proposal, and start a proper discussion about the 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 the, the questions, the responsibilities of platforms in the in the digital environment, mm -hmm. in the space of copyright, in the space of terrorist content, in the space of hate speech, in in, in all of these spaces, and have like a proper assessment and. And that that would need to take into account the interrelations that you described there. Like it's it's very interesting to see how like how 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 like the the, the requirements they try to impose on platforms like completely diverged from one type of concern that's being addressed to another one. And that's in the end like that's that that's probably not that has these unintended consequences re-influencing each other that's probably like makes it really difficult to operate these platforms and it's also like very bad lawmaking i'm going to say we have time for two more questions we have you and then charles had his hand up too and then is there another thing in this room after this yeah there is okay yeah, no, 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 no. it takes longer all we'll, we'll just ask separately <laughs> <laughs> here. my question is very brief uh, everybody as a panelist, uh, if I'm a startup, okay, and I want to have a notice and take down policy. So, right now, among the platforms that are online, which one should I mimic? <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> which is like the ideal <coughs> platform for you guys? Like, take down. Who has the best policy? 
I, I'll just start by saying, see, I really think it depends on what type of content you're talking about. I, I, that's part of it is I think it's incredibly dangerous to just take a procedure from one substantive context, rip it out of that context, and apply it this exact same procedure to solve what is really a different problem. Um, that's not only because like the procedural practicalities will probably differ, but it's also because like we haven't even gotten into how, in some ways, a lot of these content moderation fights the substance there's like a lot more substantive disagreement and shifting standards like day to day about what is actually unacceptable in part because it reflects like a societal battle over what's acceptable mm -hmm. and like that's i mean copyright is really complicated too including fair use but like some in some ways the copyright problem is even e is easier at least in certain situations mm -hmm. than that so i, I just mm -hmm. i don't know if you can even say like this is the ideal system Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. well, <laughs> I am one. Because 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 I am one. I just heard somebody <laughs> mutter, get a lawyer. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is if you were asking for the copyright context or for the hate speech context or like for, mm -hmm. uh, then, then I think it would be at least, I'm not trying to say I would have the right answers, but it would be easier to have that. Whereas I don't even know how to start if you're asking generally what content procedures should I put in place for everything. Because it really starts with the substance, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think the other side, if you're talking not just in the how do I do notice and take down in a way that keeps me in the DMCA safe harbor, that's great. Talk to a lawyer, for yeah. sure. Lots of clinics across the country would probably be mm -hmm. happy to advise. Um, for, for content moderation in general, that is, at least if you're based here in the US, you have pretty much as much freedom to design that policy as you could hope for. Your thanks to Section 230, absent. SESTA's revision and questions about hosting um, promotion of prostitution, you have pretty much broad legal protection for any of the content that might end up on your service. So you can really start from the ground up of what is the kind of service, what is the kind, is it a community that you're looking to build and host? Is it a, I don't want community, I want basic file hosting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is the service that you're really trying to develop? And you do have a lot of leeway in setting that out. Um, so then, you know, looking at are there other services that you're trying to distinguish yourself from and, and how might you do that through your content policy? Are there kinds of communities that you really like and would like to emulate, but for maybe a different subject matter um, and look at that. that? I think it would be that sort of modeling off of other ways that other platforms do it because there's, you know, there's no one right way to do content moderation um, and everybody's policies are kind of this funny mix of homegrown and plucked from different legal codes. Um, so it's, I, I can imagine it seems like a, like a vast wasteland of what am I supposed to do here? Um, but it is a freedom that is, um, it can actually be really meaningful to what is the service that you're, you're trying to provide as a startup. And if I could just add very quickly, one other thing this really points to is that the obligations and expectations for startups and mm -hmm. smaller entities should be very different than the dominant Platforms, yes. and I think that's a crucial thing, both in policy making and even in just private discussions around pressure on mm -hmm. what private companies should do. Yeah, absolutely agree. I, I agree with that, and then like keeping in mind this uh, danger of essentially creating two. I shouldn't say creating; it already exists, but reinforcing the two tiers of intermediaries in which it's very, very difficult for a startup ever to get to that mm -hmm. next level. Um. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time for more questions because the next panel has to get ready. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but I, everybody we, will be here all day, I believe, and we're happy to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah. 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 So it's all your fault. I know. It's it's like right here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> How many different identities? My hours. Like <laughs> 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.
There's, I mean, we, there's the point about the DMCA cross border stuff is also really interesting, and like, it is a, it is a lesson to how like we didn't even get into like, the, the, the idea of different legal regimes being used in places that the regimes don't apply in the first place. I mean, there's lots of examples. And like the legitimacy of a global takedown. Order versus the yeah. 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 take down response that the platform is doing. Reagan gets the DMC and they're not available for anybody to grab it. But then they fight well. The biggest groups in the fight with like France, 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 France,